we uh, define unemployment as people who are ready and willing to work for wages. Unemployed people are not unemployed in the sense that they're doing nothing. Often they're doing lots and they're working a lot too, trying to survive. They're unemployed because they're not working for wages. And previous kinds of human societies did not experience unemployment. It's monetary systems that have unemployment. Our monetary system from inception was created by the authorities. And the purpose of that was to move resources to the authorities for their use to fulfill the public purpose. It's crazy to use your monetary system to create unemployed resources that you then don't put to work. Most of your listeners, if they're not economists, will say, well, boy, that makes sense to me, (laughs) right? But if they've studied economics, it won't because economics teaches every student that unemployment is desired. Unemployment is not a policy mistake. It's a policy tool. It's the tool we use to fight inflation. So that what normal people would see as a problem, economists see as a solution. It's pretty crazy, but this is what economics teaches. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes for an introduction, which I've linked to in the show notes, along with some other things that relate to this particular episode. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. And no matter what level of support you give, you get early access to all of our episodes and patron-only episodes where you can ask me and Patricia MMT questions. We're 100% listener funded. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. A big thank you to all of our supporters so far and thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley. And I'm Patricia Pino. And we're honored to be joined today by primary MMT academic and author of Understanding Modern Money, Professor L. Randall Ray. Hi, Randy. Hi. Randy, we wanted to preemptively congratulate you on being presented with the 2022 Veblen Commons Award in recognition of outstanding scholarly contributions to the field of evolutionary institutional economics. So congratulations. Yeah. Mm, Thanks. But starting with the here and now, um, Bloomberg recently published a piece entitled, Are We Living in an MMT World? Not Yet, which you and other core MMT scholars contributed to. And the piece is quite fair to MMT. Um, I think they missed something key to MMT that could lead to confusion. The piece contains this passage, quote, MMT's take on taxes boils down to the notion that governments don't need to raise revenue to pay for their spending. Though MMT allows that tax may be useful for other purposes, such as cooling down demand, redistributing income, or discouraging undesirable behaviors. Now, I would just say They've skipped over the primary purpose of taxes, according to MMT, which is the charterless view of money and the whole sequence in which spending and taxing occurs for currency issuing governments. Could you fill in that blank? Yeah. Well, you know, I think everyone takes for granted that we live in these monetized economies. And, you know, they don't really think that deeply about how did we get here. Why is it that we take in America these uh, green pieces of paper and are willing to work hard to get those and the store is happy to accept them in payment? So most people don't, you know, wonder uh, why that is. And um, so what MMT has 
emphasize is that from inception, um, there has to be a reason why you would do it. It's not simply, it may, many people say, oh, well, it's trust. I trust I can pass this off to somebody else. But, you know, that's a, a logical uh, regress, uh, <laughs> you know, and ne- it never ends. Um, and what? And if it's only based on trust, wow, what would happen if people stopped trusting? The whole system would collapse. And we say that, you know, that that's nonsense. The, the thing that underlies our monetary system has to be something much more significant than a delusional trust that paper has a value. And so we argue that from the, the very beginning, um, when uh, authorities, and it always was authorities, uh, choose a money of account, they impose obligations denominated in that money of account that are payable in their own uh, liabilities. Um, and we call those things um, uh, money, currency. Um, And so, you know, we don't suffer from this infinite regress problem of how did the whole thing get started? Because we know both logically and historically uh, that when a new nation is formed, one of the very first things they do is choose a money of account. They impose obligations in that money of account and they issue their own obligations in that money of account. And that is really what drives the currency from inception. But let me just say, in their defense, we are so happy that um, Bloomberg and others are now focusing on uh, the important issues, which are that uh, too much spending can cause inflation, that taxes can be used to reduce spending, to uh, release resources that could be used uh, in the public interest, that we can use taxes to reduce inequality. Um, So we're really glad that people are focusing on that rather than on taxes pay for stuff. Yeah, it's much better. It's, It's definitely a step in the right direction. The other thing that gets missed if you don't have that charter list framework is the sequence that tax liabilities come first, allowing the government to spend money into existence and have that money be worth something. The Bloomberg article, the bit they used from you was you talk about how the government's pandemic response would have played out if we were in an MMT world. Could you talk about that? Yeah. Um, So let me credit Warren Mosler, you know, who always said that taxes create unemployment (laughs) and that is their purpose. So that's what taxes do, not just of labor, but what taxes do is they release resources that you can then mobilize. And that's what government uses taxes for. Um, And that's especially important when you're undertaking a big new initiative the Green New Deal would be an example. Uh, pandemic response would be another example. Um, you may need to release resources in order to tackle the problems that you face. And uh, taxes are a way to do that. Um, so if um, uh, we completely understood this, uh, we would realize that um, – you know, the, the issue of the, uh, we already spent about $5 trillion and the pay for uh, arguments really were on the back burner for that. But now we're trying to spend another $4 trillion, um, and uh, suddenly everyone's worried about the pay for again. If they really understood MMT from the very beginning, they would know that that's the wrong question. What's important is whether we can mobilize the resources that we need to do the kinds of things that Biden is proposing. I think that that's what a real understanding of MMT would do. As Bloomberg and and other people have um, pointed out, in the first rounds, MMT was referenced. But it was referenced as uh, this new way of spending that is similar to Milton Friedman's helicopter money drops. We can drop money into the economy 
Although normally we would not want to do that. The pandemic is so severe. Uh, we're going to go, go ahead and do it as an emergency measure. Now that the emergency is sort of past us, uh, uh, fingers crossed, I don't think it is, but the thinking is that it's somewhat behind us. Uh, you know, now we have to be more prudent. We can't do silly things like helicopter money again. Now we got to pay for the spending. Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, said something exactly like that. Now we have to worry about opening the fiscal space by raising taxes. That'll give us more fiscal space to do the kinds of things Biden wants. So I think that this is a problem going forward. Uh, you were talking about how people sort of don't think about what um, where money you know, they, they assume money sort of, you know, they take it for granted that it always existed and they don't really think about when that might have happened. And, um, and I know that you have a, a talk or two related to the origins of money and how that is very heavily connected to uh, the origins of debt itself. Can you say a little bit about that? So people have learned this story. And my, my older daughter, when she was six years old, came home and told me the story about Robinson Crusoe on Friday and how they were bartering a, until one of them got the brilliant idea of, you, of uh, using uh, seashells as medium of exchange. And that is where our money comes from. So everyone learns this story, I guess, now in first grade. Um, and the majority of economists uh, accept this story, not that it is literally true, but they accept the story as the way they frame their thinking about money and the monetary system and the role of the government in the monetary system. And uh, I, I think that it's a dangerous view. It's a wrong, historically, it's a wrong view as David Graeber, the late, uh, great David Graeber, uh, argued in his um, monumental book, Debt the First 5,000 Years. Uh, there is no evidence uh, for barter-based economies outside of pretty trivial prisoner of war camps and so on. Uh, no society's ever organized their economies that way. Um, so it's historically wrong, but it also gives us a wrong view of what this system that we call capitalism uh, that we live in is all about. It, it, it focuses on these individual exchanges as if, and we call it, you know, an exchange economy. We call it a market economy and all of these things. And I say it's dangerous because, uh, this is not what capitalism is all about. <laughs> it's uh, it's not an economic system in which you know Friday and uh, and Crusoe meet as equals, and they're each trying to maximize their own individual utility uh, through trade, and that that uh, the market is this wonderful invention that gives us all the freedom to engage in mutually beneficial trade. Uh, but that's not what capitalism is all about. Uh, and so we, we don't understand the system. And then we also, from this story, we develop this view that the government is sort of an illegitimate interloper into this nicely functioning system, right? The government, inter we use this terminology in economics all the time, government intervenes. The government intervenes into the economy, maybe to do good things, but it's an intervention. Um, and so we start to see the government in this kind of a light. Uh, and the government is, you know, spending our money. The government is taxing us, taking our money away from us. And then doing some things we like, but lots of things we don't like. Um, and all of this is just wrong. It's fundamentally wrong historically. And uh, as an understanding of the way our economy works. So uh, our argument is from inception, uh, the monetary system did come from the authorities. Now, those were not democratic uh, elected governments in the old days. Today, that's what we strive for, to have democracies. 
in which, um, uh, you know, we choose our government and our government is supposed to serve us. Um, that's the ideal. That's what we, we aim to do. But we can't even conceive of a monetary system without a government. We can't even conceive of a capitalist economy uh, without the government playing a huge role in the economy, uh, both uh, in, in providing our, the basis of our monetary system, but also in um, uh, creating what we call markets, which are complex institutions, uh, creating these things and regulating them in our interest. So I think that that barter story shapes the way that you view the economy and the proper role of the government. And the alternative gives you a very different view that I think is much more uh, accurate, but also more useful. I asked because uh, we had a we had a question uh, last week about uh, the the kind of viability of of a society without money, and we were discussing this. And um, do you think that the 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 money creation or, or the advent of money came together with the you know as, as societies became larger, or were they completely an arbitrary imposition on existing societies that otherwise work very differently? I think that uh, money. Uh, came along with the rise of class societies. And uh, with uh, John Henry, uh, also the late great uh, John Henry, who also recently died, um, uh, Stephanie uh, Bell, Stephanie Kelton, and I, and Ala Semenova all wrote with John Henry uh, on this connection between the rise of class society and um, the uh, development of uh, money and then gradually the development of a monetary system where the the monetary part of the economy absolutely dominates uh, and you know that's what we call capitalism <laughs> capitalism is a very unusual for human for human societies it's a very unusual kind of society where the whole, the majority of the production process, is all tied up with money. So this is why Marx, Keynes, and Veblen, the three uh, founders of the three main uh, heterodox uh, schools of thought, all came to the same conclusion. What we live in, they called a monetary production economy, where most of the productive process is tied up with money. As Marx said, you start with money in order to make more money. So it's a profit-seeking enterprise. Now, can we imagine a society without money? Very easily, because 99% of the time the humans were on earth. That's what they lived in, societies with no money. So we generally call this tribal society. Uh, there, There's varieties of tribal societies. They're, they're not all identical, uh, but they did not have money. And that is the kind of society humans lived in. And the difference, just to, to, to make the distinction, in those societies, the production is to satisfy the needs and wants directly. <laughs> it's not to make money. So that's the big difference between uh, our kind of society that is thoroughly monetized and a tribal society that has no money. So telling the MMT money story, as Warren uh, calls it, and I like it very much, um, it's telling it in a, in a functional way, the, the government issues tax liabilities, uh, which creates sellers of goods and services. It, it basically makes the whole population unemployed in the first instance, which is some, kind of hard for people to get their head around until you dig a little bit deeper with them that, that that's what we mean when we say the tax created the unemployment. So everybody's unemployed in the first instance, and then the government can then spend that money into existence to hire people and buy things to provision the public purpose, hopefully a, a public purpose that's been decided along democratic lines. But then there's this 
um, gap where the government has hired everybody it needs to hire, but there's still not enough spending power left behind in the economy, even though it's running a deficit, to give everybody that wants a job a job. And, and that's where the job guarantee comes in. That's a big difference between living in an MMT world and not living in an MMT world, I'd say. You know, with, with, the, with the job guarantee in place, like you said in the Bloomberg article, makes a lot more sense than paying airlines $300,000 per job. Could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, you know, we, we uh, define unemployment as people who are ready and willing to work for wages, <laughs> right? That is to earn money, uh, wages. That is what unemployment means. Um, the unemployed people are not unemployed in the sense that they're doing nothing, right? Uh, often they're doing lots and they're working a lot too, trying to survive. Um, you know, some people might be collecting, uh, you know, the, the bottles that are left by the side of the road, working as hard as anybody. Uh, but they're unemployed because they're not working for wages. And previous kinds of human societies did not experience unemployment. Uh, it is calculated that uh, Native Americans might have might have you know worked in the sense of producing uh, the things they needed ten to twenty hours a week, and the rest of the the time was uh, relaxing and socializing. <laughs> um, but nobody was unemployed. Okay, every everybody performed uh, their uh, socially determined functions. Uh, it's just it's monetary systems that have unemployment. The way that we define it, uh, you can't imagine unemployment without having a monetary system. And as Warren says, uh, our monetary system from inception was created by the authorities, and the purpose of that was to move resources uh, to the authorities for their use. Now again. As we both said, we live in democratic societies, so these should be to fulfill the public purpose. In the old days, that wasn't true. It was to fulfill the, the wants and desires of those who were the authorities. Um, but it's crazy to use your monetary system to create unemployed resources that you then don't put to work uh, because there's... Uh, no sense in releasing resources if you're not going to use them. So we see unemployment as always a policy failure. It must be, by definition, a policy failure uh, because there's no reason to uh, remove those resources from other uses if the authorities are not going to use them. I think most of your listeners, if they're not economists, will say, well, boy, that makes sense to me, <laughs> right? <laughs> but if they've studied economics, <laughs> it won't. Because economics teaches every student that unemployment is desired. Unemployment is not a policy mistake. It's a policy tool. It's the tool we use to fight inflation. Okay? So this is what economists have managed to do. They managed to twist the thinking around so that what normal people would see as a problem, economists see as a solution. The unemployment is desired <clears throat> because it keeps prices in check. It's pretty crazy. I mean, it, it's almost psychopathic. Uh, but this is what e e economics teaches. Um, because we wanted to set the scene for the European MMT conference at which you were a keynote speaker in September, um, I thought we could talk about MMT as it relates to the euro. Now, you've argued since before the birth of the euro that the design of the European Monetary Union is fatally flawed. Could you lay out that criticism for us? Um, yes. Yeah, so way back in the very beginning, <laughs> um, I mean, several things that sort of came together and uh, several individuals who are very important in um, helping uh, to flesh all this out. Charles Goodhart, uh, who's British, uh, wrote a piece arguing that the European experiment was 
unprecedented because it is going to delink the currency from the nation. And he said, as far uh, when you look around the world today, and as far as you go back in time, this has only been rarely done, and it was always done by very, very small uh, political units, maybe a principality uh, in Italy or something like that, uh, that would use the Italian currency rather than have their own. What almost always happens is when a new nation is started, it creates its own currency. Of course, that's exactly what America did. When we split off, we dropped the British pound and we didn't even want to call our currency the pound. <laughs> we wanted to show how independent we were. So we called it the dollar. And this is always the case, uh, almost without exception. New nations always have their own currency. And he said, it can't be a coincidence. And I think the first draft of the paper was 1996. So, you know, yes, that w- that set us thinking. And uh, then when Godley, who as early as 1992, had reached the same conclusion, he said that if you give up your currency, you reduce your status to uh, one of a colony. So if you give up your currency and adopt someone else's, you become a colony. The third piece was that um, Stephanie, who was a grad student at the time, said, um, you know, we're thinking, so the member states of the Eurozone are going to be something like U.S. states because you're all going to adopt the euro just like every state in the United States adopted the dollar. Uh, I wonder what the debt ratios of U.S. states are like relative to their own GDP. So we looked and the highest one was a debt ratio of 17%. And of course, in uh, Europe, you had Italy with a debt ratio of 100. (laughs) And the master criteria allowed 60. We said, hold it, that's three times higher than the most indebted U.S. state. This has got to lead to a disaster. The um, credit rating agencies will not allow U.S. states to um, budget deficits. That is to project that they will end up with a deficit at the end of the year. And they won't allow their debt ratios to go higher than 17%. How will credit ratings agencies allow an Italy to exist? Uh, They're going to downgrade them. There's going to be a run against Italian debt. Uh, They're going to run to the safest country, which, of course, uh, became Germany. Now, that that wasn't absolutely clear at that time because Germany was always called the sick man of Europe. Uh, in the very beginning, Germany uh, was not one of the countries you would have thought would be the high rated, but eventually that's what happened, of course. So anyway, I mean, you put those three pieces together and your predictions for the euro would be that uh, this is going to lead to a crisis. And it did lead to a crisis. And I... Uh, I guess the fourth piece is Warren very early said that um, the crisis will start as a financial crisis. And because the individual nations are responsible for their own banks, they will have to bail them out. And uh, that will create a sovereign debt crisis. So it will start as a private financial system crisis that will become a sovereign debt crisis as governments try to bail out their own banks and spend a lot of money trying to bail them out, which, of course, is exactly what happened. (laughs) Ireland was the best example, a country that had no government debt to speak of, and they they tried to bail out the banking system, and it morphed into a sovereign debt crisis. So I I think all four of those things... uh, came true. And uh, that really was the problem of the, um, the Euro design. It, it's a design flaw. Now, they, you could have easily, I don't mean politically, I mean uh, economically, you, you could have easily designed the system so it would not uh, have failed, uh, so that it would have been robust. And all you had to do is look at the United States as an example, because we have a monetary union with the dollar, and every individual state adopts a dollar. But we have um, a U.S. Treasury uh, that spends about uh, 25% or so of GDP, 
uh, and it spends it in, in a way that redistributes uh, demand on a somewhat progressive basis. In other words, spends more in the poorest states. Um, whereas the European Union uh, had a, a budget of about 1% of GDP and it wasn't net spending because it was contributed by members. So, you know, it's 25 times too small. <laughs> so <laughs> you just do the math and you know that this can't possibly work. Even in the US, the states have become bankrupt and faced with resistance from the Fed. Was that the case of, of Detroit? Yes, yes. So Detroit, you say, well, they were a pretty poor place. So it's I, I like to use Orange County because it's one of the richest areas in the United States. And it did default. It did go down. So yes, yeah, state and local governments can go down. Um, and then um, the, the federal government could, of course, bail them out. Uh, and you could also use your central bank. And so people have discussed doing this too. So the, the point is that the, um, the sovereign center, the central government can prevent it. Now, ours chooses usually not to do that. It allows Orange County to fail. And that's not, I wouldn't say that, you know, there's not a good justification for that. So they see this as a way to discipline. So they will allow failure, but we still have a social safety net that will help protect uh, the, the people who lose. So when Orange County fails, what happens is uh, teachers and uh, firefighters and the police uh, lose jobs. Uh, and that then affects you know demand uh, more generally and unemployment goes up and all that. So if you have a good social safety net, you can protect uh, the people who lose their jobs and so on. Um, and you can provide more funding, try to keep the schools open and all of that. Uh, policy can, can definitely do that uh, to protect um, from the worst uh, possible fallout. Now, whether or not you should allow a county default on its debt, it, you know, is worth discussing so as you mentioned there that you can have a a national federal social safety net and that kind of circles back to the uh, mmt job guarantee so you know when we want to simplify but hopefully not oversimplify mmt for policy activists here in say the uk we'll say mmt is a lens that allows you to see how the money system works and we can get into that but long story short there's only one policy prescription in mmt which is the job guarantee which we've talked about or the transition job as warren likes to call it or employer of last resort and then we could work back from there to tell you why we think that's important and necessary and just better than the way we deal with inflation right now but right now we use an unemployed buffer stock to buy inflation and we think using an employed buffer stock is better on a point of logic. But crucially, we can boil it down to this idea that if we implement the job guarantee, we know that the government, the issuer of the currency, will be injecting spending power into the economy precisely where it's needed to sustain true full employment. And then the lens part of MMT shows us how the government can always afford the job guarantee in terms of currency. But a policy activist in a Eurozone country can't say that about their own government. Um, you know, how should activists and, and people concerned with, with policy in, in Eurozone countries apply MMT to their thinking about policy space and, and a way forward? Well, I, I think they, they definitely should demand a job guarantee. It has to be funded from the center, though. Yeah. It would go a long way toward uh, resolving many of the problems in, in the euro area. Probably it should be a single wage, just like we advocate for the United States. It should be generous. It should provide um, benefits, a benefit package, uh, and it should establish um, good working conditions. You know, the, the number of hours per day, the vacations, uh, uh, break time, all that stuff. If you provide all of that in your job guarantee program, that becomes the minimum standard all over Europe. And um, uh, people can vote with their feet. <laughs> so uh, private employers have to match the um, whatever those minimum standards are. So that helps to uh, equalize up. So the, the uh, 
uh, poorer nations, uh, where wages are lower, where working conditions are worse, um, will be brought up to the higher standards that the program sets. So you're, you're trying to integrate uh, Europe and you're trying to raise the living standards in the poorest nations. The job guarantee helps to do that. By paying the higher wages, you're also uh, increasing the demand. Uh, in the the lower uh, income um, uh, nations, so you're you're bringing up demand in those areas too. We make all these arguments for the United States. You know, the same thing would happen in Appalachia, in America. Uh, some people say, "Oh, well, we should keep the wage lower in Appalachia." I say, "No, that that doesn't make sense. Let's raise the wages. Let's increase demand in those areas. Um, raise the living standards all over the United States." Uh, you know, we're all American, and in Europe, they're all European. They all ought to enjoy the same good things, and this is a way to do that. Um, so the, uh, I think the job guarantee actually helps the integration. Uh, it helps reduce uh, inequality across nations, um, and it helps to um, increase demand uh, in the um, uh, the parts of Europe that are being left behind. So for all those reasons, the job guarantee is a way to do it. The, but individual nations, as you were saying, cannot do this. It has to be funded from the center. If I heard right, um, you said that you would apply a single level of wage throughout Europe. So that would effectively homogenize the economy of Europe and level things up. Yep. Yeah, that, no, no. that makes sense because I was wondering, you know, how you know how what wage level you might set in Germany compared to wage level in Italy and Greece, where the where the cost of living is lower, and you know what arguments that might lead to. But actually, if you just said one single wage, that simplifies everything. <laughs> That's the way I would do it. Not all supporters of the job guarantee agree with this. I know that in the United States, we have advocates for having several different wage levels. Uh, I'm not dismissing the arguments that they're making, you know, so they say, well, hold a second. We, we're pushing for, um, we were pushing for $15 an hour in the United States plus benefits. In the U.S., you know, we don't have health care. So the benefits would be a very significant boost to the living standard for Americans. In Europe, if you already had um, good health care benefits, then maybe the 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 uh, boost to the benefit wouldn't be that great and and maybe you would want a wage above fifteen dollars an hour. I'm not saying that that would be the right number for Europe, but one of the the goals is you know to create a a, a well functioning um, labor market and to stabilize the value of the currency uh, you know the these were always part of the buffer stock argument of using the job guarantee um, program. And the way you do that is you is by setting the base wage. That base wage establishes the value of the dollar or the value of the euro. Uh, that is our argument. But some people say, but hold it, you've got college graduates who can't find a job. And if they only receive $15 an hour, they couldn't even pay their student loan debt, which could well be true in the United States. But, you know, our answer is that first, uh, we're trying to catch people that, that are, you know, falling down. We're setting a floor, okay? And um, $15 an hour is a huge improvement over our floor now, which is zero. <laughs> um, and we're not trying to retain people in this program. They're available to be hired out. And so who's going to be the first hired out? Well, likely those college graduates. Um, they're going to be hired away when the economy improves. Third, college graduates should not be in this program. <laughs> okay. So if, if we're operating our economy with so much slack that college graduates can't get jobs, the answer is, you know, to speed the economy up. It's not to raise the wage in the job guarantee program. It's to operate the economy at a, a, a higher growth rate so that jobs are being created for college graduates. 
Um, and then third, of course, people should not have to go into debt to go to college. <laughs> yeah, that was my number one, actually. <laughs> what we need to do is, you know, eliminate all the um, student debt. We need student debt relief. Uh, and then to find a different way to finance college education, people should not be uh, going into debt to do something that is in the public interest, which is get an education. You know, we, we already won that battle for uh, uh, grades up to grade 12 in the United States, which is basically 18 years old. Oh, and we won that a very long time ago. <laughs> so uh, you, you can get free schooling to age 18. Uh, I don't remember when that finally became the standard for the U.S., but all of my lifetime, that's been the standard. Um, and then we've never raised it, which made no sense whatsoever. We want people to go to college. We, it, it, let me just give you an example. So we have a huge problem with the, the medical uh, delivery system. We don't have nearly enough doctors, especially general practitioners. And the pandemic has made this much worse because a lot of doctors uh, have re retired because of the pandemic. They were overworked and didn't like the way things were going and so on. So we have a acute shortage of medical delivery people. And one of the reasons why we have a shortage is, so other than the retirement is, it's too expensive. People can't get a medical education because it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt that they then have to try to work off the next 20 or 30 years uh, when they practice medicine. And the obvious solution is, free medical education, right? That's the public interest. Uh, so the answer is, uh, you know, college education needs to be free. It's funny because I, I often hear uh, mainstream economists speak about a problem of over-education in the economy. And you see, you seem to be saying there's no such problem. It's, it's the opposite. We're not utilizing the people who are educated. We, we have a lot of miseducation, <laughs> So I'm not trying to minimize that problem. Um, you know, we have severe shortages in some areas, severe shortages. And um, those are typically filled by um, immigrants, uh, foreigners uh, who um, come to the United States, get college education and, and go into those fields. We need to start um, at a much younger age, you know, age three years old, trying to uh, prepare students for the kinds of jobs that we are creating. So there, there is a bit of a mismatch. And we probably have far too many students uh, uh, going into business school and not being well prepared for the kinds of jobs that we, that we are creating. So there is a bit of that. But the notion you're going to have people who are too, too educated just uh, <laughs> doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> Going into some of the more technical aspects of MMT, uh, for anybody new to this, MMT is a branch of post-Keynesian thought, which is a development of what Keynes actually thought. And Randy, you've made the observation elsewhere that Keynes talks about money in different ways at different points in his writing. He writes about it differently in the treatise on money as compared to the general theory. Uh, could you talk about those differences? In the general theory... There are three uh, chapters that are the most important ones uh, that, that deal with um, money. Uh, chapters 13 and 15, and then chapter 17. And uh, so this is a bit wonky. Our audience will love that. <laughs> <laughs> Only students who have had you know, intermediate level macro at the undergrad level will be familiar with what's called the ISLM model. So this was the way that Keynesian economics was taught almost everywhere in the post-war period. The model was actually developed by Hicks, who was a contemporary of um, Keynes and sort of an opponent. And that model more or less faithfully reproduces the view of money that Keynes had in chapters 13 and 15. And so to just be extremely brief, it is sort of a fixed money supply and a downward sloping money demand curve. And that's what you use to derive the LM curve. Behind that is sort of the assumption that the government controls the money supply. 
then you have a money supply. Money demand determines the interest rate. So there's a fixed money supply. There's a single interest rate. And there's a, a demand for money that is a function of income and interest rates. It's a very, very simple model. And that has always been taught as being the, the Keynes model. Chapter 17 is completely different. Chapter 17 is a liquidity preference theory of asset pricing. So that's even more wonky than the other one. <laughs> and chapter 17 is a very difficult chapter. Almost nobody reads it. Uh, the, the few mainstream economists who've tried to read it, like Paul Krugman said, I can't make any sense of it. They don't know what it, what it's all about. It's a generalization of the theory of interest rate. Remember that his, his book is called the general theory. <laughs> so <laughs> it is the theory of interest rates of the general theory. Okay. So it, it really is the chapter that we need to focus on if we want to know what Keynes was thinking about money and, and, and interest rates. But unfortunately, it's almost virtually ignored except by the people who are often called the fundamentalist Keynesians. And fundamentalist sounds bad, uh, but uh, it, it wasn't, wasn't meant that way. These are um, people like Paul Davidson, uh, Hyman Minsky, and uh, Jan Kregel. And, you know, all of these were developers of the post-Keynesian approach. So post-Keynesians are more familiar with this in general and uh, realize that, you know, this was a, an important part of the general theory. The important point is the money supply is not taken to be fixed. Okay. It's in our, the terminology we use, endogenous. And the, the second point is there's no such thing as the interest rate. Keynes said there is an implicit interest rate on anything you can hold through time. He said there's a wheat weight rate of interest. There's a steel rate of interest. Okay, And there is a money rate of interest. Anything you could hold through time as an asset has an interest rate tied up with it. So it's a generalization of the theory of interest rates. And it's interesting that, that Keynes developed this view based on earlier work that uh, he and Straffa had done. First, when they were speculating in commodities, Keynes famously uh, had bet on, um, I think it was uh, wheat futures, and uh, ended up having to take <laughs> and store wheat at the University of Cambridge. <laughs> uh, but they, they made fortunes in commodities, and then they made fortunes in exchange rate uh, futures. So they used this theory uh, to speculate in commodities and exchange rates. And I think another famous one was when uh, Keynes said he had, he had broken the uh, Portuguese currency. <laughs> so okay. Someone has calculated that Keynes at one time was as rich as Warren Buffett. Uh, he was very successful. He also lost a lot of money too. You know, he made money and he lost money. But he, he left Cambridge, uh, King's College, a very big endowment, managing their funds. In the general theory, he, there's a footnote where he says, uh, the, the monetary details are going to fall into the background. He was trying to simplify the exposition, except in that chapter 17. And uh, the reason why he could do that is because he had already dealt with all the monetary details in the Treatise on Money, which is a two-volume book. It was you know, sort of his life's work uh, in 1930. He published it in 1930. And uh, as it went to the press... He wrote to his friends, he said, I'm already dissatisfied with it. <laughs> okay, he spent all this time, two volumes, goes to the press. He says, I'm starting to write a new book. <laughs> and that became the general theory. Because he had made a huge mistake in the treatise on money, which is that he had no theory of the determination of output and employment as a whole. He took those as given which is what all 
the mainstream economists, what we now call the neoclassical school, had done. He did what everyone else did. He just assumed the economy would be at full employment. You'd be producing as much as you could using all of your resources. So the treaties assumes full employment. He realized that was a mistake. Okay. So the new book was going to explain the determination of employment and output as a whole. That's what the general theory is. It's a, a theory that explains what determines output and it need not be full employment. So that was the revolution of his thought. That's what the general theory is all about. He was resolving that error from the treaties on money. But he, he didn't mean to change any of his monetary theory, his theory of money and interest rates. Okay. Uh, and he had laid out, you know, how money works, how banks work. Uh, he had uh, written um, a bit about the origins of money, the history of money, uh, based on um, work he had done in the, uh, in the teens between 1914 and 1919. Um, he, uh, he knew Knapp's work. Keynes was a chartalist in the treaties on money. So uh, he wasn't trying to change any of that. What he was trying to do was to explain the, the determination of output and employment as a whole. And he was continually urged by the young economists who were working with him, called the, the circus, the Cambridge circus, uh, continually urged to make it simpler. Okay, they said, no one's going to understand what you're talking about. Make it simpler. Make it simpler. Use supply and demand because economists understand supply and demand. And, uh, and there are three, three different areas in the general theory where he does that. He simplifies. He reduces us to supply and demand. And all three of those lead to huge problems, <laughs> such as uh, reducing his money theory to an LM curve. Okay, so all, all three cases where he did what his students told him to do, simplify it, make it supply and demand, lead to uh, conceptual errors and, and lead to controversy because he gets attacked by people like Srafa who know, uh, you know, what the problems are of reducing things to supply and demand. Um, to your knowledge, to what extent was Keynes aware of Marx's works and influenced his work at all, or, or was he nothing to do with them? Well, obviously, you know, there were um, uh, political biases. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Keynes Kane said, when the revolution comes, you know, I'll be on the side of the bourgeoisie. Okay, so there are huge political differences. People have um, explored this and... Um, uh, students who took notes in Keynes's classes, those notes have then been incorporated into uh, into books. You know what Keynes was actually teaching in the classes. There's there's not much doubt that uh, Keynes understood but strongly disliked uh, Marx, and that um, the framework, at least for the original drafts of the general theory, were all. In a uh, in the same frame as uh, Marx's, that is, I, I, and I already said this: the monetary theory of production. You start with money to produce things to sell for more money. That was the frame, and um, the the early drafts of the the general theory are much more clear on this. That that is the way he set out to do it: uh, monetary theory of production. That pretty much all got deleted. Uh, you can see the early drafts in his collected works. Uh, so you can see the similarities, but uh, the final product, uh, you don't see much, except th there are the statements, you know, the, the entrepreneur has no other interest than to end up with more money, okay, to make profits. So that, that still exists, but it's not so obvious. But other people have... Um, you know, done the comparisons. Uh, there's a nice uh, article that I use often uh, in classes that you can map the general theory exposition to Marx's departments exposition, essentially one to one. Okay, so the 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 end result 
the theory of effective demand has an almost exact counterpart in Marx. Is it a bit ironic that at, at the moment, the when we talk about you know um, economists of a, of a certain political bent, we always refer to the Keynesians as the leftists, when obviously that was not Keynesian's intention? Well, Keynes in many ways was progressive. And uh, the policy recommendations at the end of the general theory, chapter 24, policy recommendations, I think anyone who reads those would see those as very progressive. So he wants to um, uh, greatly reduce inequality. He doesn't want an equal distribution. He says there is some justification for inequality. People who work harder and who take risks should get a higher return. But he says um, the the amount of inequality we actually have, the, the capitalism produces on its own. So it, it wasn't a coincidence. He saw this as a tendency. The amount of inequality that it produces is actually detrimental for everybody, even for the capitalists, uh, because uh, it keeps demand so low that you have to be inordinately lucky to make it if, if inequality is really high. Um, so uh, he, he wanted less inequality. He wanted full employment. Uh, and he wanted to euthanize the rentier class. Now, euthanasia is a pretty radical <laughs> policy prescription <laughs> for people who live on interest income. Now, of course, he didn't mean kill them. <laughs> uh, but he is purposely using a radical term, euthanize them. He wanted to euthanize them through what we would now call zero interest rate policy, ZERP. Keynes wanted ZERP permanently. So monetary policy always should aim for a zero overnight interest rate. That was Keynes' policy. He used another um, uh, radical term. He wanted to socialize investment. Okay, well, socialism, again, another radical term. It's not completely clear what he meant by socializing investment. In the general theory, it's vague. If you read through uh, other things he wrote, like especially um, the uh, little pamphlet, The End of Laissez-Faire, it seems more like government and uh, corporate control over the investment decision, probably something more like Galbraith Sr., the um, uh, new industrial state sort of arguments with government planning and government support. You, you have this, the kind of early post-war planned economy with high aggregate demand and high investment. That seems to be probably what he wanted. The last time we spoke, you told us that Warren Mosler's observation that bond sales are a reserve drain was the thing that you'd never heard until he'd said it that way. And that had started this line of inquiry for you that grew into what we now call MMT. So... Um, and the idea behind that statement, if I'm right, is that whether the central bank or the treasury sells government bonds, it's draining reserves system-wide. And when reserves have been drained to a certain point, there's a system-wide shortage and it causes banks to need to lend reserves to each other. That creates an interest rate on bank reserves. So the big insight is that government bond sales are a monetary policy operation, no matter which branch of government does it. So does that sound about right so far? Yes. So I was a deficit dove for sure. Um, I didn't worry about government debt. I, I figured that... Uh, the demand for government bonds was uh, virtually without limit. But when Warren said that, you know, suddenly you realize that you shouldn't think of debt as borrowing at all. Okay. So I, I wasn't worried we would, you know, run out of the ability to borrow by issuing bonds. But when he said that um, it's just a reserve drain, and then I thought back to my money and banking class. Stephanie and I both had this professor, John Ranlett. So we had gone through all of this, and I knew the, 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 what we call T accounts, the accounting for it. So I knew he was right. 
And that just instantly changes your view of what the bonds are doing then. All they're doing is draining reserves. It's not a borrowing operation. The reserves have to be put into the banks first. And if that's true, <laughs> you're not <laughs> borrowing, okay? Because the reserves are not a borrowing operation. It is the central bank that is either buying uh, up assets from banks or lending to banks that leads to the creation of the reserves. There's no borrowing operation there at all. Uh, and so once you realize that, then uh, you know, you're taking the blinders off and you see governments don't borrow. I, I had always thought the government could you know, print money and pay for things and uh, wasn't worried about that either. Uh, but the, the, I did think that they were borrowing and he made it very clear that's not true. So then, then you just see the bonds in a completely different light. And then, of course, you can instead just pay interest on reserves. So putting aside the effect of quantitative easing for a moment, um, I've been working with the idea that central banks outside of a policy like quantitative easing hit their interest rate target by adding or draining reserves through open market operations. But I've also heard you talk about a thing called the announcement effect. And if I've understood that correctly, the idea there is that the federal open market committee's own announcements of their target interest rate in and of themselves serve to achieve that rate. Nobody wants to fight the Fed, I believe the saying goes. And, and so if I've got that right, presumably bond sales still do drain reserves. But if the government aren't buying and selling bonds to affect interest rates, and they're not doing it to raise revenue, as, as we've established, where does that leave us? Well, see, some of this is uh, because of these peculiar operating procedures we had in the United States <laughs> uh, <laughs> up until 1994. In the United States, the Fed did not announce its target interest rate. So we didn't know what it was. The Fed would meet behind closed doors. At the end of the meeting, uh, they would allow one reporter to, to phone them. The reporters are next door <laughs> in another room, uh, but they're not allowed in the meeting. They got one phone call uh, and uh, the Fed would read a little statement that would say, in view of the conditions, blah, 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 of the economy, we've decided to slightly increase pressure. <laughs> and that was it. Okay. And so then the markets had to try to figure out, oh, okay, what is the new overnight interest rate target? Increase pressure. That sounds like they're going to raise it. What is it? We don't know. And so it, it would take a little while for the market to figure out what it was. And the, the Fed might have to push the market a little bit. You know, maybe the market uh, thought it was going to go higher than what the Fed wanted. So they're going to have to put some reserves in. Or it didn't go high enough, the Fed takes some reserves out. So the Fed did engage in open market operations to nudge the rate to the secret rate they wouldn't tell the market <laughs> what they were aiming for. That all changed in 1994. And that's a very interesting story why it changed. Uh, but anyway, so after that, the Fed said, okay, we're going to be transparent now. We're going to tell you what the, the target is. And once you do that, it's going to go there immediately because uh, you know the Fed is going to put it there. So uh, no one is going to lend below that and no one's going to pay more than that. So the market rate is going to move to it immediately. Um, so they don't have to do anything anymore. So it, it was this strange thing that the Fed wouldn't tell them what the target was <laughs> that, that, that then forced the Fed to actually do things. Now it doesn't have to do anything at all. But it still does open market operations. Sure. Uh, it will do those um, in coordination with the, um, the Treasury because the um, Treasury impacts uh, bank reserves. Uh, either uh, tax receipts or Treasury spending will impact bank reserves, and the Fed has to um, accommodate those. I think Warren calls it offsetting operating factors. Right. Yep. Okay, got it. You've mentioned elsewhere that you think the Canadian Central Bank has probably the most efficient approach to targeting their interest rate. Could you talk about that? Yeah. So they um, banks are um, encouraged to try to end each day with zero. 
probably everything has changed with QE. I know nothing about Canadian QE. Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, all the countries that adopted QE have put massive excess reserves into their banking system. Okay. Uh, so now you're, you never have to worry about banks being short reserves because they've got trillions of extra. Uh, so the Fed never has to put reserves in in, in advance of some uh, big, uh, you know, April 15 is tax day in the United States. You don't have to put reserves into the banks in advance of that because they have so many extra. There won't be any impact. So anyway, the Canadian system was aim for zero. If you end up short, that's perfectly fine because the central bank uh, allows an overdraft and charges you interest. If you end up with a positive amount, that's perfectly fine. The central bank pays interest on reserves. Canada was already doing that, I'm pretty sure, when I was writing Understanding Modern Money. So that's like 90, 1997. Canada had already moved to that system. By contrast, in the United States, the Fed paid zero uh, interest on reserves. So uh, you couldn't um, leave extra reserves in the, the system because the uh, interest rate would drop to zero. In other words, unless your target was zero, which it never was back then, uh, you would be pushing the market rate way below your target, all the way to zero. In Canada, it couldn't fall to zero because it would only fall to whatever the central bank paid. We, we also changed. So after the global financial crisis, the Fed got permission from Congress to pay interest on reserves. So we've moved to or toward a Canadian system, but we've had QE ever since. So our banks have massive excess reserves since the global financial crisis. And, um, you know, there's lots of discussion about how do you get out of that? Will we ever get out of it? Will we ever go back to um, normal where banks only hold the reserves that they're required to have? And your answer to that question is, is it even important? We want a permanent zero interest rate policy, just like Keynes did, right? I would prefer that we took interest rate setting out of the hands of the central bank and um, and set it by Congress. And yes, uh, zero or very, very low. Uh, and don't use that as a policy tool. That, that would be my preference. And in that case, you could be paying zero or very, very low. Then the next question is, do you want to still issue government bonds? <laughs> the interest rate on the shortest term bonds is going to be very close to whatever that interest rate target is. So 30-day bonds are going to be very similar. And then you start to wonder, does it make any sense to issue bonds if all the bonds are as an alternative to reserves? Why not just get rid of the bonds? And that's what you know, Bill Mitchell and uh, Warren Mosler have been um, advocating. Let's just stop issuing the bonds altogether. And do you think that uh, on that bond issuance, um, is there a place for that, say, you know, in, t in times of war, I know that they have bonds have been instrumental. Is there a chance that bonds may become, again, instrumental in, in the case of a, of a climate emergency, a Green New Deal, um, or any other sort of immediate need? for savings. So yeah, it's it's part of patriotic saving. So it's your patriotic duty to not consume. And here we will give you a reward. We will sell you a bond and we, we will pay you this interest rate. So yeah, I think that uh, it can serve uh, an Im important, um, important place in trying to release resources. Uh, it's preferable to taxes. <laughs> Uh, people don't like taxes, of course, but but also the point is taxes remove the income permanently, so it's gone. What bonds do is it shifts uh, the income to later, and that's probably what you want to do. If we're undertaking all of this investment in building a sustainable, I mean, environmentally, socially sustainable economy, maybe it's going to take us 10 years to do that. Uh, you know, that's sort of the, the time frame people are looking at to green the economy. So let's say it takes 10 years of massive investments to do this. We only want to reduce 
uh, resource use for consumption and private investment uh, for 10 years. After that, we're going to have greater capacity and it's going to be sustainable capacity. We want to release the spending. Um, so that's the good thing about the bonds. Uh, people only postpone their consumption. They don't have to permanently reduce it. So that that's why you want to use bonds. I also think even aside from fighting the, the multiple pandemics, there is a positive role for bonds to play. Uh, I would keep savings bonds uh, as an option. So I wouldn't eliminate all bond sales. I, but I would say that you know only uh, households and maybe not for profits would be allowed to buy savings bonds. Congress would set the interest rate, set the terms, maybe put income limits. People uh, with income greater than seventy thousand wouldn't be able to buy these, just as a way to promote safe private saving among uh, low to middle income people, you know, for college, for uh, buying a house later and and so on, to give them a safe alternative to um, private uh, financial institution offerings. So you recently co-authored a policy note with Edward Lane entitled, Why President Biden Should Eliminate Corporate Taxes to Build Back Better. Now, this, in my experience, has been a very tricky point to get across to progressive people, even when they understand MMT. Could you just lay out the idea behind this policy note? Yes. (laughs) So uh, as an undergraduate, as I said, I uh, studied money and banking with John Ranlett. And I studied uh, public finance uh, with um, Wilma Krebs. And um, she used Musgrave and Musgrave, uh, I guess, husband and wife uh, team who wrote the most famous public finance book. And a, a lot of it is, you know, very mainstream economics uh, with the neoclassical micro theory. But a lot of it also is Keynesian. They had chapters in there that uh, went through the corporate uh, tax. I I read all this in the late 70s, but it's always been in the back of my mind, uh, you know, that the the corporate tax has a lot of problems. And then Hyman Minsky, my professor, dissertation advisor, uh, had a section in his book. And I remember in class also talking about the problems of the corporate income tax. And then uh, finally, Beardsley Rummel who we've used, uh, MMT, he went went around the country after World War II saying, taxes are no longer needed for revenue purposes. The war has taught the government and the people that we don't need taxes to pay for stuff. He also uh, had a long section on how bad the corporate tax was. It was his main example of a very bad tax. Okay. And all of them pointed out that uh, in terms of tax incidents, which means that, you know, we, we put the tax on corporate profits, but who really pays it uh, may not be the corporation because corporations can pass it, we say pass it forward. That is, they can raise the price to consumers to cover the tax. They can pass it backward. That is, they pay lower wages to workers to make up for the tax, or they can pass it to the shareholders, which uh, means that they pay less dividends uh, to the shareholders. Okay, if they pass it forward, it's inflationary and probably not progressive uh, because you're hitting consumers. If they pass it backward, it is hitting workers, not progressive. If they pass it to shareholders, good. <laughs> that, that's progressive, okay? Because shareholders tend to be higher income. But then you look at who the shareholders are. Only about a quarter of shareholders are American individuals. 75% are not. Uh, if I remember right, 40% are foreigners and the rest are institutions, which includes uh, your pension funds and so on. So only 25% are potentially, uh, you know, it would be a potentially progressive tax. And uh, economists debate all the time about how much of the shifting occurs. 
the estimates are wide, so I will admit that. Uh, my my belief is that uh, it's probably mostly workers and consumers that pay the tax because our corporations have uh, both uh, power in pricing and power in wage setting, especially after Ronald Reagan and the destruction of labor unions. So I don't think it's a progressive tax. Then there are other potential problems such as offshoring, moving your headquarters, which might mean you only have a mailbox in Ireland. Uh, now, Biden is, is trying to deal with that. I think that's a, a good thing. If you're going to have a corporate tax, it's got to be international. Hmm. Uh, otherwise, you're just uh, encouraging corporations to play games to uh, avoid and evade. Avoid is legal. Evade is illegal. They do both uh, to uh, avoid and evade the, the corporate profits tax. So it creates problems like that too. And so, you know, we, we wrote it up and I, I, I know progressives hate it because uh, two reasons. If you look at corporate tax revenue as a percent of federal income, federal revenue, sorry, we call it income, <laughs> uh, and also states, uh, it has plummeted for two reasons. One, the tax rate has declined, but also it's the evasion and avoidance. So it's plummeted. Potentially, it could raise a lot of revenue if you could enforce it and raise the rate. So they see it as a way to, to uh, get a lot of revenue to pay for all the good things they want. And of course, we know that's nonsense, <laughs> but they really truly believe that. And the other reason is because, and the response will be, but, you know, corporations are evil, so we ought to tax them. And my response to that is, no, if they're evil, we ought to shut them down. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> uh, you, you don't tax evil, you stop it. Uh, and I think corporations do engage in a lot of evil behavior, and we have a solution to that. Corporations have to get charters. Uh, the chartering process, because from the very beginning, the idea behind corporations is they have to serve the public interest. And if they're not, they should not exist. We should take away the corporate charters. I think that's a much better solution uh, to dealing with bad behavior of corporations. You take away the charters and you say, sorry, uh, you are no longer allowed to be a corporation that's publicly owned. Now, we have problems with the, the private-owned owned ones, too. So we, we got to deal with a, a lot of uh, bad behavior by firms. Uh, but I, I think that arguing taxing, taxing them because they're evil uh, is just not the, the right way. If we want to go after the shareholders, and I think that is what we should do, uh, we should be imputing uh, all of the um, profits to the owners of the corporations. Not for profits own corporations, they're already exempt. So we, we don't need to, to tax the holders that are not individuals, but we would impute the, the profits to the owners, the individual owners of stocks and tax them as normal income. I think that's the right way to get at the shareholders. Okay, well, I think that's a great place to leave it. We've been speaking with Professor L. Randall Ray, author of many key MMT texts, most importantly, Understanding Modern Money. And Professor Ray will be a keynote speaker at the upcoming 2021 European MMT conference. And you can find links to Professor Ray's work and to information about the conference in the show notes for this episode. But for now, thank you so much. We we're so honored and it was yeah. great. Thank you so much for joining us today on the MMT podcast, Professor. L. Randall Ray. Thank you. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon starting at a dollar a month and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino, and you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.